Okay, thanks for having us. Um, let me just uh, explain to you how we think this should uh, work today. We are both people who are interested in the very, very broad area of AI and cognitive science, but in quite different ways. Um, Jeff is a computer scientist with uh, a growing interest in social science as an area where AI can be applied, right? <laughs> I am, on the other hand, a communication scholar who has been studying computer science in recent years and currently works with, a method, with methods from AI. Um, so part of having a crosstalk is actually figuring out where two people have a substantial point of intersection. And that was very rewarding. We had lots of discussions in recent weeks. And we arrived at the following idea of an intersection. Although we are very different, we are both interested in the notion of reasoning. Um, the twist is that Jeff sees this notion in an essentially positive way, and I see it in a more negative way. <laughs> so this will be a pro-contra talk on reasoning uh, in AI and cognitive science. And so Jeff will have his 10 minutes first, then I will have 10 minutes, and then we thought that we will open the floor right away. We, will, we have questions for each other, but it is not really necessary to put them first. We can just wing it directly after our two, two 10 minute things. Is that it? So I'm Jeff Hardy. I teach at the University of Maryland, and my 10 minutes are starting. Um, <laughs> OK, so unlike Gwendolyn, who wants to eliminate reasoning, <laughs> I'm trying to extend our understanding of reasoning by developing a formal theory of ordinary common sense reasoning, not, not a theoretical or scientific or mathematical reasoning, but the ordinary sort of reasoning involved when we deliberate about or justify everyday actions or conclusions. So there's two formal theories out there already, I think. Uh, there's standard decision theory with probabilities and utilities and expected utilities. And then there's um, ordinary mathematical deductive logic. But typically in our reasoning, what we do doesn't seem to conform to either of these theories. Typically, typically we focus on actual reasons, or, or we say we do. So my, my standard example is if we're going to have dinner tonight, and I want to I convince you that we should have dinner at Obelisk. This is my favorite restaurant in D.C., and it's where I always want to have dinner. I'll, I'll give you reasons. I'll say the food is terrific, the new chef is getting great reviews, if you think we shouldn't go there, you'll give me reasons too. We won't do a decision theoretic calculation. You'll say the parking is horrible, the prices are atrocious, and so on. Um, so that's a practical case. Consider a, a case involving knowledge. If I want to explain to you why I think raccoons have been in the backyard, I won't do a deduction from some big database of knowledge about animals and their behavior. I'll just give you a few reasons. I'll say. Dogs couldn't have done that amount of damage. No other animal could have climbed the fence. Those tracks look like raccoon prints. Um, so what I want to try to do is to take this, this ordinary appeal to reason seriously and systematize it, develop it into a real logical theory. The idea I'm working with is that reasons are provided by um, default rules of inference, a default logic, which is a form of logic introduced in computer science for similar but somewhat different reasons. And I'm taking this logic in and developing and extending it to a, a real theory of reasons in their interaction, I hope. So you'll be happy to know that I'm not going to tell you about the logic. Um, that would be bad. Instead, I'm just going to go through a few patterns, patterns of um, inference. Does this work? OK, so I'm just going to go through a few patterns of inference, then my time will be up. So suppose I tell you. You can think of these things as the data that I'm trying to explain, these little inferences. Suppose I tell you Tweety's a bird. I have a pet named Tweety. That will be a reason for thinking that Tweety can fly. That's this. Right, so this little single arrow line indicates alternatively the reason relation or a default rule. That's how I understand it. So if that's all I tell you, my pet, my twi pet Tweety is a bird, you'll think, well, Tweety can fly. But if I tell you something more, that Tweety's a penguin, in fact, that's a reason for thinking that Tweety can't fly. That's what this little negative arrow means. And this is a stronger reason. This reason, or this default rule, is stronger than this one. 
So you'll go ahead and withdraw the original conclusion and conclude instead that Tweety can't fly. This is a very standard example in AI. When I showed it to Wendell and he said, yes, we studied this. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, <laughs> um, so that's easy when the reasons are, are ordered in that way, but sometimes reasons aren't ordered, and this is another standard example. This is the Nixon diamond. <laughs> if you learn that Nixon is a Quaker, that's a reason for thinking he's a pacifist. If you learn that Nixon is um, a Republican, that's a reason for thinking he's not a pacifist. These reasons don't stand in any necessarily strength ordering with regard to one another. There are all kinds of different things to do in these cases. I'll just mention two of them. One is to plump for one reason or to plump for the other reason. So you could say, I'm going to go for that reason. I'm going to believe he's a pacifist or because he's a Quaker. And somebody else could say, I'm going to believe he's a Republican because he's, uh, I mean, not a pacifist because he's a Republican. So you could get to these different equilibrium positions. Um, and that's different from ordinary logic, which guides you to one set of conclusions. This is more like a, some game theoretic or economic notion of equilibrium, where you can wind up different places and be settled. Or, or you could uh, take the skeptical view and in face of conflicting reasons like this, um, not conclude anything at all. The question is actually open what to do there. There are many more options, but I just wanted to mention a few. So I don't want to give you the impression that the only problems are caused when reasons are not ordered. This is just a simple example where reasons are actually completely ordered. Imagine it's pretty cold outside, and I'm a soldier, and the captain tells me, turn on the heat. Um, the major, that's the captain's order, turn on the heat. The major, who outranks the captain, says, don't open the window. The major's concerned about pollution or something. And the colonel, who outranks both of them, says, if the heat is on, open the window. Now, you can't, you can't obey all of these orders. They all give you reasons, right? It's just unclear what to do. Uh, we can come back to that if you want. <laughs> I have a view of what to do there, but it's a, it's a little bit complicated. My view <laughs> is that you should obey the captain and the colonel. And then if the major says, why didn't you open the window? I told you to open the window. You have an excuse. You could say the colonel told me, sorry, why did you, I told you not, right. You can say the colonel told me to open the window. Um, but what's odd about this is that you're, if you wanted to obey the two higher ranking officers, the major and the colonel, you'd blow off the captain. So it's two ways to go. Now, where do these priorities come from? Um, that's the interesting question. And um, one of, the, one of I think of the real advances in this work is trying to work out a view where at the same time you're using these reasons to draw conclusions about stuff in the world, you're doing the exact same kind of reasoning to draw conclusions about the priorities which are guiding your first reasoning, your first kind of reasoning. So imagine now that you're a young Nixon. We're not trying to decide what Nixon is, but you're a young Nixon and you're trying to decide, you, you notice, you say to yourself, well, I, I see that I'm a Quaker so I should be a pacifist, but I'm also a Republican, so I should not be a pacifist. What do I do? And then you get stuck. Um, so you could go for advice, and you could, you could find a church elder, say, who could tell you that, you could find a church elder who'd say, well, I see that you have two reasons, but your religious reason is stronger than your political reason. But then you could find a Republican person who would tell you, the other sort of thing. Anyway, you're doing reasoning about the priorities at the same time you're doing reasoning. So that's, that's, that's a, a pattern of inference I want to account for. And then finally, we have this different reason relation. This is a philosophical example. Suppose something looks red, the object looks red. That's a reason for concluding that it is red, right? Um, but now imagine you take drug one, and that makes everything look red. Um, that's not a reason for thinking it's not red. It's a reason for excluding this from consideration, for concluding that it is red. If somebody else, if your friend says, you know what, all those things look red, but that thing right there really is red, you'll go ahead and conclude it's red. Um, so this excludes that. It can get more complex. You can take drug two, and drug two can uh, be an antidote to drug one. All of a sudden, you'll conclude it's red again. But what's going on? 
What's going on is drug two excludes drug one from consideration as a reason for excluding the fact that the object looks red as a consideration from concluding that it is red. So you get these patterns of interaction, and that's, that's the sort of thing we're trying to account for. So I have a minute and a half, I think, right? I want to tell you who cares about this. <laughs> <laughs> Logicians care about it because the logic is cool. Philosophers care about reasons. Some cognitive scientists are doing experiments with this, with the predictable, chaotic results. Um, I think there are some computational applications. Linguists see it in semantics for generics. Linguists are interested in this kind of work. And I think it's especially relevant in philosophy of law. There, there's, a, there's a field that is um, really self-conscious about the relations among reasons. Finally, I, I want to leave you guys with a question, which is, um, suppose I'm right, and this idea of thinking about reasons and so on is a model of rationality. We really are agents that deal in reasons. I wonder why. Why aren't we, why aren't we decision theoretic machines? Why aren't we logic machines? Is it just a cognitive heuristic? So if we weren't so stupid, would we be doing decision theory and logic all the time? And we wouldn't have to talk about reasons like this? Or um, is there something deeper going on? That's, that's where I am.